Tri-Cities, even though it is through this remote um, way of, of doing things that we're doing uh, at the moment. Uh, one thing that wasn't uh, mentioned that I am also a, a 2011 uh, graduate of Columbia Basin College. The, I have an associate's degree in chemical dependency counseling from uh, Columbia Basin College. And then a 2000, 2013, I graduated from WSU Tri-Cities uh, with a degree, a bachelor's degree in psychology. And I'm very, very proud uh, of those degrees. Those were, um, you know, I was the first in my family to, to go to college and, and, and those degrees mean a lot to me. And, and my roots uh, in the Tri-Cities uh, really uh, mean a lot to me, even though I live uh, here in Redwood City, uh, California today. So uh, again, um, uh, I'm trying not to cry, but uh, it is an absolute honor to, to, to be here today. So start with that. Um, I want to go over uh, a couple of things. I'm going to share my screen for just a moment because I do, I, I think that it's, it's important to um, hopefully illustrate a couple of, uh, a couple of things as I, as I kind of go through here. So um, I'm going to start here and share my screen. So one thing that I want to kind of get across is that, you know, it is, it is very much so important to, when, when we talk about uh, prison reentry, when we talk about, um, you know, the, the journey uh, that, that people have uh, overcoming addiction or, you know, overcoming obstacles and barriers to, uh, that, that present themselves in prison reentry, uh, it's important to really understand it, that it is the systems and the community uh, that are in place are, are, that are so important. I would, I would say even more important than, than you know, some of the individual characteristics that it takes to overcome um, uh, some of these things. Uh, these things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen with a lot of support and mentorship from uh, people uh, and, and a community that is, is supportive of these things. And so I wanna make sure that, that people uh, understand um, that I, I'm very, lucky and privileged to work in a field um, where I can lead with this information that I am formerly incarcerated, that you know I went through some of these things. Um, I know that other, um, other fields, other professions don't have that same luxury, right? I, you know, if I was an electrician working in a, uh, you know, uh, working as a, as a contractor, this is not information that I would lead with in, in my work. And in fact, uh, there would probably be a lot of guilt and, and shame uh, around this. And so, you know, I, I think that uh, I, what I hope is that, you know, someday we will all be able to be empowered to advocate, not just for myself, but for, for everyone to advocate for them, their selves uh, and their chosen profession. Um, and so I, I want to, I just kind of, again, want to reiterate that, you know, sometimes when we, we, we build up and, 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 and try and champion the person that's overcoming these odds, we really miss uh, what, what's going on underneath. And, and, and again, I, I was the result, you know, my, my story is the result of um, a lot of things that were in place that allowed me to, to do that. And so uh, I just want to make sure that, that people understand that I realize I, I do just inherently have some survivorship bias uh, in this and, and want to kind of get that out of the way uh, first. Um, and so I, I want to I talk really briefly, you won't find this in any uh, you, you won't find this in any textbook and you won't find this in any uh, peer reviewed literature, but this is something that I've kind of come up with based on my own experience and, and, and then what I know uh, from the research uh, that I, I find this to be um, a fairly compelling argument, uh, even though I've never uh, tried to write around this, this issue. So this is the best theory of mass incarceration. Uh, I think that the, the um, what we have um, is we have these three public health issues. Uh, and so this is meant to be kind of a Venn diagram uh, showing these interlocking um, issues of addiction. So problems with substance use disorder, uh, mental illness and, and poverty. Um, and what we have done as a society uh, is we have criminalized these problems uh, to a degree uh, such that we see this huge huge uh, increase in the last 20 or 30 years uh, in, our in our prison population uh, as a result of really criminalizing what, what should be public health issues, um, but we have dehumanized people uh, 
into or we have dehumanized individuals that that have these issues uh, to such a degree that um, it, it makes it very easy to um, uh, to you know throw these people in cages uh, and then not really kind of uh, worry about them or or, or you know understand uh, what is what is really kind of uh, going on uh, with these these three different uh, issues. Uh, and a lot of times I get questions um, about, you know, well, how, how does, how does, you know, like this, this idea of, of like structural racism or how do these kind of uh, play out in these issues? Um, and again, I am not an expert, but if you were to ask me, I would say that, you know, systemic racism probably plays a, a, a very large part uh, in all of these things and is very, very hard to uh, pull apart. Uh, and then on top of that, we have three the, the systems that are set up for us that serve these needs. So the healthcare system, the Department of Corrections, uh, the Department of Education, these state level systems that are in charge of, of, of kind of addressing these, these issues are also kind of grounded in their own form of um, uh, institutional uh, racism and, and, and really dehumanizing people. And so whether that's uh, black or brown people or, or, or addicts or psychos, or, you know, we have all these stereotype terms that, that again, it becomes very easy, or easy for us through language uh, to dehumanize uh, the, these individuals. Um, and I would say that, you know, there are obviously um, structural issues, whether it's the, the media, uh, the war on drugs, uh, redlining, uh, tough on crime initiatives of the, of the 1990s, um, they all kind of feed into these, these stereotypes and, and our uh, policies that have really kind of um, made this happen. So in my experience, if you're going to, the, the issue with, with this is that any one intervention, so if you're trying to lift someone out of, out of poverty over here, right, if you're trying to lift someone out of poverty through an intervention uh, with uh, a higher education and prison program or, you know, a, a reentry program to, to, you know, hopefully find people better jobs or train them to, to get better jobs, if you're not fully addressing these other issues, so the substance use disorder and the mental health issues, uh, you know, generally what, what happens let me back up a little bit. So these these three issues, public health issues, are are feeding mass incarceration or driving mass incarceration. And then when people end up in prison, these issues generally don't get better, right? And in fact, I would almost make the argument that a lot of times these issues or these problems will get worse uh, for a person when when they come while they're in prison, and then when they come out of prison, um, they you know they have all of these. Um, uh, regulatory issues uh, that that don't allow them to 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 succeed and 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 these barriers that that don't allow them to succeed. So you have this system where you know people are coming out of, of the prison system. None of these issues have been addressed yet we're expecting individuals just to go back to their their normal lives or go back to their neighborhoods and 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 you know live this life of 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 crime and then also deal with their substance use disorder and also deal with their you know any kind of mental health issues um, and so if an intervention is going to work then it has to include all of these areas. So if, if, if we're talking about an intervention to, to again, you know, uh, provide education to someone, these other issues need to be uh, kind of taken into context uh, as well. Same thing for substance use disorder, right? You could have the Hazelden or the Betty Ford Clinic come in and treat people while they're in prison, but if you're releasing them and they have no chance at, at finding a job, they're, they're um, you know, their, their hopes for uh, really having any kind of career is 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 diminished and so again i just want to reiterate the fact that you know if you're going to have any kind of intervention that is meant to have an impact on reentry that main outcome being recidivism uh, it has to address these other issues to be successful. And that's why everyone that we see as successful uh, has obviously worked very hard, but they've also been extremely lucky in that they were uh, in a place where systems were in place for them to be successful. So I can kind of talk a little bit about that through my own uh, through my own story. Um, I'm not going to delve into it, uh, you know, uh, 
in, in great detail. Um, but I, I will definitely say that, you know, or, or kind of start out just by saying that, you know, I was, I grew up very, I didn't come from an overly police neighborhood. I come from a white middle class uh, neighborhood just outside of Vancouver, Washington. Um, and uh, I, I ran into substance use disorder issues. I, I, I um, you know, in my in my early twenties, uh, I went through a breakup and then some other emotional things that that I didn't know how to deal with, um, and that was just the catalyst, uh, along with a, a lot of other things uh, that I'm I'm kind of glo glossing over uh, for for you know to, for me to have a very severe methamphetamine uh, addiction uh, and just overall substance use disorder uh, issues. And so, um, you know, this this uh, resulted uh, in, in, in a, a fairly lengthy uh, prison sentence. I ended up serving seven years in the Nevada Department of, of Corrections. Um, but that's really where my story begins, I, I, say, I, I think. Um, I, I was able to uh, attend some, some AA meetings, uh, which kind of got me grounded and, and comfortable in this idea of, of uh, coming out of prison uh, in recovery and, and what that meant. Um, but I was also able to, I was, I was extremely lucky in that I was at a prison uh, where there was a college in prison program. And so the Community College of Southern Nevada uh, came in and offered college classes that are still on my transcripts today. And I'm, I'm probably more proud of those uh, classes than I am of a lot of the other classes that I've, I've taken along the way. Uh, those were the, those were that, um, the foundation um, I, I was able to learn some study habits that, you know, I had never really picked up along the way in, in high school or in junior high, but I was able to pick up some study habits uh, that I was able to um, uh, take with me uh, when I left. And, and so those early grades, really, really pushing myself to get good grades early on while I was in prison, um, that really well helped to uh, fortify this idea that that I could excel once I got out of prison as well. And so I had my dad drop me off at the uh, at the gate of or at the front doorsteps of, of CVC that day that I got out in, in, in 2009, June 28th of 2009. Uh, and I told him, don't come back, back and pick me up until I've, I've gotten signed up for, for school. And, and that was the beginning uh, of, of a journey that, you know, is still going on today. I'm still learning uh, today. Uh, and, you know, I, I can't, um, I can't say enough uh, about the mentors that I've had along the way. Dr. Sarah Tregresser at, at WSU um, has been a great friend and uh, an incredible, um, an incredible mentor along the way. Uh, Dr. Or, uh, Kaylin Stevens at, at uh, CBC, if anybody knows her, um, she was the one that really even got me thinking that I could, uh, you know, got me thinking about graduate school and, and really was such a, um, uh, a motivator uh, for me. And, 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 you know, at the time she probably didn't even realize it, but it was just one thing that she said uh, that for me in that moment, um, early in my educational career outside of prison, uh, it just meant the world to me. And it was something like, you know, you have the ability to go to grad school, right? She said that in class or at a meeting we had one time. Um, and and I, I can't tell you what that meant to me in that moment. Uh, it meant that someone believed in me and someone believed that, that I had the ability uh, to, to go on and do things that I had never even thought was, was possible with the, with the expectations that I had set for myself. I had only set the expectation of becoming a, dr a drug and alcohol counselor, right? That was the only job that I had ever heard of, of people that, you know, weren't getting out and doing construction or, or something like that, uh, that, that that's what they could uh, excel at. And so, you know, I really want to um, uh, drive home the fact that, that uh, you know, I was, I, I, and I, again, I'm still very, very lucky, right? I, I, there, there's so many things, and we'll get into this, I'm sure, in other questions that you have. Uh, there were so many things in place. Um, so, you know, I had, a, I had stable housing. Um, I had mentorship. I had uh, job opportunities. I had family. I had friends. Um, and, and, you know, I was, a, I was very lucky in that I didn't see any um, uh, boxes, uh, criminal history boxes on any applications uh, for college that I, I, I I applied to uh, as well, at least not early on. And so uh, those, those things made a huge difference in, in you know, me being not only successful, but, but me being able to uh, uh, kind of 
uh, traverse that road of, of higher education. And I think the, the pinnacle to all this um, for me was going back into the prison at Coyote Ridge and actually teaching inside the prison in the summer of 2018. I, I trotted drugs in society course. And that was, um, it, it just, you know, every day I was almost in tears as I went into the prison because, you know, I could see that that hunger for knowledge um, in, in, you know, I had 25 students in my class and there was just this hunger for knowledge. And I remember having that same hunger for knowledge uh, in, a, in a college and prison program. Uh, and, and it was just like this, this, this full circle uh, kind of a moment for me. And, I, and I, again, I feel so privileged and honored to have been able to go back and, and teach inside of a prison. Uh, and it, it meant so much to me. And, and I hope that it meant as much to the, the students that I had uh, as well. Uh, and, and that hopefully that it inspired them, uh, not just the, the material we were learning in the course, uh, but it inspired them to, to, to really um, you know, think about a, a long-term commitment to higher education uh, once, once they are released. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, 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 and stop there. I think the second part of your question was about guiding principles. Um, or practices, was that the second part? Yeah, yeah, so this um, is, we appreciate, yeah, so just, those are awesome, um, you know, you've given us some good foundations, so yeah, how do we, where do we go with that? Like, what are some guiding principles for us as we think about the relationship between these key factors and how we piece it together? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll stop sharing. Um, I think that uh, one thing that I would say is, I think as a society, uh, we need to understand the disease model, right? Just understanding what a disease is in general. I find it, um, I find it um, disheartening. Uh, you know, even um, my 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 uh, nephews and, and and other people that we really truly don't understand uh, what a disease is. When we learn what a disease is in in um, you know early. Uh, junior high school, uh, it's always focusing on on cancer, um, and 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 so I I I would hope that um, in order to understand the disease model of addiction, we really need to understand the disease model, how it came about, what kind of is is entailed, because that will lead us to really understand the disease model uh, of addiction. That is so um, is so under under. Uh, known, I don't know if that's a word even, but, uh, but it, it, you know, we, we, we are doing a huge disservice uh, when we're not introducing, when we introduce early on in early education, what a disease is, the disease model of addiction should, should lead the way. And we should definitely understand that uh, because I, I find that, you know, by the time students get even to college, if they don't have that foundation in, in understanding that disease model of addiction, you know, some students are already of, of that opinion that, you know, this, this idea of um, that, that, you know, the kind of the choice model uh, of addiction. And, and so uh, I would definitely, you know, that we still need to have this conversation, I think is, is kind of ridiculous. And I, and I think that we have failed so many people just with our, our, our inability to understand the disease model uh, of addiction um, and understanding that addiction is a public health problem. Uh, as well, I think from a very very early age, we're, we're shown it's not right. We we're shown these images that um, uh, that that don't uh, show show addiction as a as a public health problem, and that that it's much more a, a criminal justice problem. And I think that those stereotypes and and that messaging uh, really works to um, uh, dismay people and 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 to think that you know uh, you know those those are bad people. And 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 um, I know that that was definitely true for me, and I think it, I think it's still true today. Day. Um, I think there's some really great um, th there's some really great documentaries. I'm, I'm kind of a documentary buff. I like to, to watch documentaries. I've seen the the documentary on the Bard Prison Initiative is really really great on on Netflix. Um, I think the Thirteenth is a great foundation to, to understand how some of these things work in the in the, in the prison system. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the new documentary by Brian, Brian Stevenson, and I was so lucky at WSU uh, Pullman I got to speak as part as part of um, the the book uh, there, there was a, a common reading 
program around his book uh, back then uh, in, in 2016. And, and, and so I got to uh, speak as part of that series and it was just such a great opportunity. But his new uh, documentary called to True Justice uh, really kind of, again, it, it just kind of uh, put, paints a picture of um, you know, some of the, 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 the guiding practices and, and, and I think just a, a educational foundation to really, really, truly understand why we are the most, um, why I think as a country we're, we're comfortable. I, it just amazes me that we're comfortable um, being the most, um, uh, uh, this most mass incarcerated civilization of all time. Um, and that is just blows me away that, that we are the land of the free and the home of the brave that but yet we're comfortable with with being the the the, the largest incarcerator ever in, in the history of civilization and that uh, is, a, is a testament to kind of the what, what we've what we've really created with and, and what we're, we're comfortable with so again I would point you to those documentaries I think they'll they'll, they'll explain it much better uh, than I can in, in, in two minutes um, but the disease model is is, is just so important. Thank you, Dr. West. All right, so um, speaking of creating, right, uh, I really appreciate the title that you chose for this presentation. And as we think about the, the title for the conversation that suggests that we can cultivate a prison to college pipeline, right? And for those who might be unfamiliar, the idea borrows from scholars like Erica Miners, who have identified a school to prison pipeline, essentially suggesting that there are identifiable factors and experiences in public education that exponentiate and build momentum that orients some people towards prison, right? So then borrowing on that concept and flipping it in a positive way, please describe how we can build a prison to college pipeline and also strategically stack up experiences that exponentiate and build momentum towards and through post-secondary education. Yeah, no, a great, and I, I mean, I mean, you make a great point and, and it's a really important topic. I think that um, it, it's so hard to change narrative, right? We, we, we think about these things and we think about, you know, kind of how they're pitched to us uh, either through the media and I think sometimes it's very disheartening, right? The, the argument with this population for some reason, when we talk about education, right? With any other population, right? So K through 12, uh, higher education for you know people outside of prison. It is always um, framed as a benefit for society, uh, and for some reason, I, I mean, and you know, I, I could venture a guess at, at why, but for some reason, the argument with this population for for individuals that are incarcerated, uh, the narrative is always around uh, social justice, or or the narrative is it tends to be around uh, this idea that is a uh, just another freebie for 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 people that 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 are in prison, and why should we why should we pay for this with tax dollars uh, when these people have made a, a, a mistake and not really truly understanding the the larger or taking time to understand uh, the the larger issues here, and so um, I, I think that it, it's important to understand that that first and foremost that you know this this idea that with any other population that we talk about education, you know we, we talk about it as a as a as a societal good uh, that we're we're lifting up or that we're we're um, uh, using and 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 again with this population uh, we we just don't think of it uh, that way or, or that's not how it's 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 pitched to us and you know to illustrate I definitely remember going in and um, you know I, there was a lot of waiting around when you when you teach in prisons and. Um, so I'd wait and I'd strike up conversations with the correctional officers um, and, and they would say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally against this, right? I, I have to pay for my daughter's uh, education. Um, uh, I have to, you know, fully finance my daughter's education. Uh, and, and, you know, the, these, these guys come in here and they, and they get this for free. Uh, and, and I would always try and urge these, these uh, 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 individuals to, to think about the, your, 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 these issues are not mutually exclusive and you're making them sound as though they are. Um, there can be an issue with, um, you know, uh, keeping our community safe by offering education to, to lift someone that, that's struggling with, um, you know, that's struggling after they get out of prison, uh, having things in place to be able to do that. That's definitely one you know, argument for something, but but it's all right for there there to be issues and serious issues uh, with um, uh, college not being affordable for for middle class families, and so you know that we that we 
pit these two ideas together um, is, 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 again, it's just one of those disheartening things that I think that, that uh, the media does a good job of, of, of really um, kind of exploiting this issue. And, and I, think, uh, I think it's, um, uh, you know, I don't like it. I mean, let me just kind of put it that way. I think that, that it really uh, tends to take away from, from a lot of the work that, that's being done with, uh, for this and, and a lot of work that, that really does keep our communities uh, safer. So, you know, I would say that uh, early transition period is so vital, right? So housing, uh, parole demands, right? finances, trying to change or avoid people that, you know, have gotten you in trouble in the past or, or contexts that have led you to incarceration, you know, and, and so often these people are friends and family, right? So you're asking people when they get out to avoid their friends and family, you know, have this new life, um, you know, control your finances. Um, and, and again, if I asked anyone in this, on this call to avoid your family for even a week or, or, or two weeks or a month, uh, some of us would probably be like, oh my God, I can't wait, right? But COVID is, is killing me. I'm, I'm around these people way too much. But for the most part, uh, you know, we, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for us to, to, to think about. Um, but a lot of times that's what people that are coming out of prison uh, have to do. Um, you know, and I would say, say especially for, for people that are you know, going back to uh, inner city over-policed neighborhoods, it, it becomes very, very difficult. Uh, and then your life is scrutinized so, I mean, with a microscope, uh, you can't make any mistakes. And, and one mistake, missing the bus, can, can send you back to prison. Uh, it is a very stressful, stressful uh, existence. And so that early transition period is so important. So making sure that we have resources for for people as they're as they're coming or out of prison to be successful not that's going to to lead them back to to prison uh is is so important and, and starting early in the process you know i got started in my uh, higher education uh in, in prison program uh you know basically six years before i got out so it really kind of started that process very very early to me i think the day of their arrest or the day of, of going to prison is really when you need to start thinking about uh, Reentry. Um, I, I love. Uh, so my, my, I'm going to give a plug for my friend, even though he's a husky, and I'll have to give him, you know, a, a little bit of. Um, uh, I always give him grief for that. But you know, my friend at University of Washington Tacoma, uh, Dr. Chris Beasley. I mean, he has an incredible program that he started over there. Uh, the the Pearl uh, Lab that he has uh, that that is is you know building these post prison pathways for um, uh, formerly incarcerated scholars. And you know, I hope that we can uh, follow up on that. I mean, there, there's so many great things. But um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I I would definitely say that that there are things that, that, that can be done to, to, to forge that post-prison um, uh, or, you know, uh, prison to, to college pipeline. And, and, and those are the, some of the things that just kind of come to mind. That's great, thank you. Uh, so, I mean, we would love to hear, yeah, I think probably with, with your particular the, um, knowledge of these issues, if you do know of cool programs or things that are happening, feel free to discuss them. Because I think sometimes for a, for a lot of folks, um, unless you have some sort of connection, prison can be really invisible. And it's yeah. it, the architecture, it's it's designed that way, right? And so for there's a lot of us who it's like, man, I, I wanna care, but I, I can't even imagine where I fit in or I don't know what's going on, right? So um, to that to that end, uh, a follow-up question. So if, if, we, if we really wanna change this narrative and figure out how we can create a prison to college pipeline, what do you see as the role of the community? Or I think, I guess, going back to this um, program you know about, what what, Who's doing this well? Who do we know? What what models are what's working well? And um, and if not specifically, like generally, what would you like to see communities do? And again, you know, I think that that education is 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 key with with these with these issues. Um, there are a lot of um, myths surrounding people coming out of prison. Um, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll I'll give an example. I was testifying. Um, for a, a bill in, in the Washington State Legislature a couple of weeks ago, it was um, Representative uh, Levitt is putting a, a basically a, a post incarceration or a uh, prison pathways, uh, you know, basically uh, taking and, 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 and giving some money uh, for uh, 
uh, incarcerated students to, to follow, uh, to, to get into to college and prison programming. And one of the comments was from uh, a lawmaker, and I, I mean, I just sat with it for a minute, but his comment was, um, uh, so basically he, he said that he felt that people with meth convictions should be barred from any kind of STEM programs, right? We shouldn't let them take any kind of chemistry courses or anything like that. You know, we don't want to train basically people that are in the, that, you know, have drug convictions to become, you know, the next Walter White, right? To, to uh, take a, a pop uh, culture uh, figure and, and, you know, have the next breaking bad as a result uh, of this. And it, again, it just really, it, it sat with me because that's me, right? I, I have many, many, um, many convictions for uh, possession of methamphetamine, for manufacturing of methamphetamine. Um, if anything, I would argue the, the complete contrary uh, to that point, which is we, we should be getting those people into STEM. We should be, uh, you know, capitalizing on that interest in chemistry uh, or that that interest in uh, STEM programming uh, and really, you know, taking them in, in a different direction. And, and so this kind of stereotyping uh, is, is so harmful. Uh, and the crazy thing is it's backed by no evidence at all, right? There's no, it, it's just a, it's, it's kind of like a, a scare tactic, right? It's this, this, this idea that, you know, we're, we would somehow be doing this. There's no evidence to suggest whatsoever that, that college and prison programs, you know, train Walter Whites. Um, that there's, there's no empirical evidence to, to show that that is, uh, that anyone has gone on to a, a, a career in, um, you know, making uh, methamphetamine due to a, a, a STEM course. And so, you know, perpetuating those myths uh, can be, be very, very harmful. And as a society, when we, you know, when we hold, when we hold someone accountable for, for the deplorable recidivism that we see, um, you know, we can, let, let me back up just a tad bit. So I think that we, we get really, really locked into recidivism as like the only outcome when it comes to uh, prison whatsoever, right? That's the only thing that we 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 tend to be be uh, interested in. Yet the I would say that the prison system itself uh, is set up on this perverse profit motive um, that it, it would make absolutely zero sense to for them to ever figure out that problem, right? Because uh, recidivism is what actually fuels their their profits or their the way that the, the they're set up financially that that fuels the the prison system. So for them to solve that problem um, is, is is just it, it doesn't really um, make sense. So I I think that we need to find a way as a society as a community to hold prison systems accountable for their recidivism, right? We, we hold hospitals uh, accountable for their, I mean, that, that's one of the things that hospitals are graded on uh, is their, you know, return visits by, by people that they, that they treat. Um, and I would say that, that prison is no, if, if, if m many of the people that are going into prisons have these exorbitant mental health issues and substance use disorders, these are, me these are public health issues. Um, and, and we're not treating them and they're not coming out and staying out. We need a different system to hold prisons accountable because right now they're, 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 um, the motive is to keep people coming back. And, and so, I, and I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm just throwing that out as, a, as, as, a, as something that we need to figure out as a community and as a society uh, how to do because until prisons are held to a standard um, to to, um, uh, to to really really uh, uh, reduce recidivism, uh, I, I don't think that we'll we'll ever really see the 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 kinds of results um, or the the reduction in mass incarceration uh, that that we hope to that I I hope to see. And so you know, finding a way to 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 hold hold prisons and the prison system accountable uh, that that you know, and I I, I I've seen it done. I, I, it scares me to say that because. You know, when, when, we, when we had all of that work around No Child Left Behind and some of those issues um, uh, that, that we saw that, you know, actually resources were taken out of the areas that needed it most um, with, with No Child Left Behind. I would hate to see that be the case with the prison system, but, but we have to have a way uh, that doesn't, um, doesn't profitize 
people going back because right now that's that's the that's the prop that's the motive uh, and 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 so until that happens um, I, I don't know that we'll make a whole lot of progress in in, re, in uh, an answer to mass incarceration. Yeah, that's a um, it's a provocative it's a provocative idea, right? And to kind of I think I think you're right that to the extent that we can I was going to say get outside the box and of course in this context that you know it, it lands right, right 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 you know uh, but. But it's true. It's like so. Um, just to think expansively of who all is involved in how folks got in, who all can be involved in how folks get out, and and where is there is there some shared responsibility? Is there some shared opportunity for thinking about um, just thinking more expansively about how we think about these things? And I think for me, even in my experience teaching inside, if, just to share really, just to kind of be like, oh yes, yes, I was, as I was listening, um, I went in thinking, okay, I really, let's think about intergenerational incarceration and what can we do in an arts-based classroom to attempt to disrupt that? And even then, you know, I, I like to have thought that my thinking was expansive because I was trying to think outside of the classroom, but I was totally taken off guard that when I said, hey, let's think about disrupting intergenerational incarceration, um, the incarcerated students that they decided to work with their grandchildren. Right? And I was thinking, oh, you're going to work with your kids. You're going to try to stop your kids from ending up in the system. And, and they were already one generation beyond what I could even imagine. Right. So again, just thinking as expansively as possible about um, what are all, who are all the players and what are all the ways that we can kind of tackle these really complex issues that you laid out for us in the beginning. Right. It, very much Venn diagram, lots of overlapping things going on. So thank you for that. Um, I have a question. Um, so Pell grants are coming back for Encart, like, do you see a role for us either specifically in Washington State or just like, do you have, do you have any thoughts on Pell grants that you would want to share with us and how that might oh, absolutely. be part of this process? Yeah. Um, so one of the cool things that, that I, that I am allowed to do now, um, is to really advocate for, um, uh, things that help me along the way. Right. So, you know, I, I think that whether it was, you know, helping with the ban the box legislation for college applications in the state of Washington, or whether it was, you know, advocating on behalf of, of Pell Grants to be reinstated for anyone that doesn't quite understand, um, the 1994 crime bill um, made it, basically made it so that uh, colleges um, effectively could not go in prisoners could not get, were not eligible for, for Pell Grants. And so what you saw was the drying up of all college and prison programming really for, for quite some time. Um, and more recently, there, there's been a, some a, kind of a small expansion. Uh, the Obama administration, uh, as one of their initiatives was a second chance Pell uh, site. So they, they picked some sites that, that, you know, they ran as kind of like a, um, a pilot program to see if, you know, maybe this would be, uh, doable kind of in the future. And one of the results of, of that was, um, you know, really pushing people like me to go out and advocate and talk about uh, how, how this is so important and how, you know, college and prison programming really changed my life. And so um, I, I hope, it is my hope that, you know, that Pell, Pell the reinstatement of Pell and uh, and for for people in prison uh, will really expand that uh, greatly. My hope is that WSU, that UW, that you know some of these these colleges uh, really take advantage of this and, and and go in. You know, basically you're you have two two choices when you're in, in prison, right? You can go and work kind of for menial salary and, and work in or, or work in prison industries, and you know they they kind of sell you on this idea that. That you you're going to learn a, a trade that you can use when you you get out. But in my experience, um, I don't. I've never really met too many people that that earn a learn a trade that is, you know, directly relatable to anything on the on the outside. And and so you know, this is one thing. Um, a, a col you know, like I said, I'm still so proud of those college credits that I earned early on uh, at the college and prison program through the Community College of Southern Nevada. I'm so proud of those those college credits, because not only they, did they help fortify this, this, you know, uh, uh, thought that I could be successful, um, but, but they also, um, you know, offered me a, a tangible, something tangible that I could take, that I could earn while I was in prison, that I could take with me outside of prison, that was really, really going to benefit me, uh, that I was going to be able to transfer to a, to a four-year school. Um, and, and so, you know, 
that that ability to to be able to do that and then just understanding right like I, again I, I can't can't tell you the the you know just how incredible it was the experience of going back into prison uh, through Walla Walla Community College and teaching uh, and and just knowing that those individuals are going to be able to um, uh, you know go on in a lot of cases because Pell's been reinstated some people are actually going to be able to earn four year degrees not just two year associates degrees in these college and prison programming so it just brings a huge smile to my face and and you know I'm I'm really I'm so happy that that uh, um, uh, th that with that COVID relief package, they were able to, to package that, that, um, uh, that, that uh, withdrawal of, of, of the ban of, uh, of Pell. And, and so it will be, so, I, my guess is that it will, it will change so many people's lives. That's fantastic. Thanks. Uh, I, I have looking, I had one more question for you, you know, that I had sent you ahead of time, but I was looking through some of the questions that are coming in and, um, it's important to me out of out of respect to never ask formerly incarcerated people like you know to, to tell their story i want them to tell their story their way when they want but i did sure. notice there was a question in the chat and i recognize the name of the person and i know that this person um it has been supporting a family member who is incarcerated and i just wanted to take the occasion to really acknowledge that there probably are a lot of folks um, who have joined us this afternoon who are here for very personal reasons and for whom this topic is very personal and so i just want to um, especially thanks thank those in the audience for whom that that shoe fits, but then also to ask um, either you or maybe you, if you don't want to share your own experience, you could kind of let us know what you know from others. Um, what are what was your biggest fear about paroling, or what is the biggest challenge with reentry? I mean, there's there there are many, but um, and this coming from someone who's hoping that's an experience their family has soon. Yeah, um, it, great question, and I I I, I appreciate it. Um, and again, I'm speaking for myself. Um, my biggest fear. Um, was any shot at a career. I mean, I just did not think that I was going to have any kind of shot at, at any kind of career um, and, and way to, um, you know, support myself. I mean, I just didn't hear of too many people getting out and getting good paying jobs. And so, um, yeah, that, that for me, that was the, that was the biggest fear. How am I going to support myself with 21 felony convictions and having to lead with that, with every, every meaningful conversation that I have, right. Whether it's for housing, uh, whether it's for, you know, getting back into school, uh, whether it's for getting a job, um, you know, it, it it's, it, it's detrimental to have to lead, lead with that information. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, again, I'm speaking for myself. I know a lot of people, you know, getting out, you know, their substance use disorder is, is maybe their, their biggest issue. I had a lot of time to work on substance use disorder while I was in, in prison, uh, but, and then for other people uh, coming out, their mental health issues are, are, are sometimes the biggest issue. I just had a friend that, that went back to prison here in California, and it was really um, due to, uh, you know, him not taking his, his, his mental health medications uh, or losing coverage for his mental health medications here in California, not being able to refill his prescription. And, and, um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, my, my issues are my issues. Uh, but, but I think that, you know, other people, some people, it's going back to the neighborhood uh, that, that they got in trouble with. It's so hard to, to, to remove themselves from people that, um, or, or to stay away from people that, that led to them getting in trouble in, in the first place, because again, sometimes they're family members and, and really close friends and at breaking those, those connections um, are very, very difficult uh, to do. And, and so traversing that is, is sometimes hard for, for other people. But for me, again, it was definitely the, the fear of not being able to have a career. Thank you. Uh, I want to take a quick pause here. Uh, Dr. Best has graciously agreed to, to be with us until 5.30, but in case folks have to scoot off at the hour, I wanted to pause momentarily and um, let Christine make a few announcements, and then we have more questions. So we hope, you'll, we hope you're able to stay, but in case you aren't. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm um, just to reiterate um, a point that I made earlier, um, I will put the link for students in the, in the chat so that you can confirm your, your attendance if you're taking part in the common reading. And then I also wanted to announce that our a next uh, community classroom event will be taking place on March 21st at the same time, 4 p.m. And the focus is gonna be um, the role of the community in disrupting the a school to prison pipeline. 
So we hope that you will uh, join us for that session as well. Thanks, Anna. Of course. All right, so uh, Dr. Vest, I, we have some more questions, but I, I don't, we've covered a lot of ground and it's, I just wanna kind of give you, I guess, a chance if you wanna kind of pull us back to something that you think that's really important or needs to be highlighted, um, something that we missed or something that we just, something we should talk about that we haven't asked about yet. You're muted. Uh, I'm, I, thank you, story, story of my life. Um, so I am going to, uh, I'm going to give myself a plug here for just a second. Um, so, and I, and I want to talk about it in this context of um, the value of, live, of lived experience. Um, so one, probably the most, um, for me, uh, the most meaningful contribution to science that I've made happened very recently. Um, and, and so uh, I, I was able to, um, I was able to converge uh, and collaborate with some, some uh, researchers at the COVID prison project. They reached out and I, I just wanted to be involved because I knew um, from my own experience in prison, how impossible it was to socially distance and, and what a, um, and, and we're seeing that play out, right? You know, I, I thought about this a year ago as COVID was breaking out, but we're seeing, you know, prisons have been eight out of the top 10 hotspots for, for COVID have been in prison. And so kind of having a, a really great understanding of that early on um, and, and, you know, kind of drawing on my own experience in prison, uh, I thought it would be really, really important to um, write a paper uh, on that. And, and so um, I got a chance to use, um, some of the, the statistical uh, expertise that I had uh, and, and stuff that I learned at, at, at WSU through great mentors, uh, Dr. Burns and Dr. Cleveland and, and, and some really great people that pushed me in those stats courses that I didn't want to do. Um, but now, uh, you know, I, I got a chance and I'll, I'll put it in the chat here in just a minute, uh, but I, I got a chance to um, publish a paper, first author paper um, on COVID in, in prison and, and really um, kind of pinpointing, at least in the Texas prison system where we where this data set was was pulled from, you know, showing that prisons that were operating at under 85% of their capacity uh, were, were the most effective uh, in, in limiting both prison death or COVID deaths and COVID outbreaks uh, in, in these prisons. And so, um, you know, that just being able to get like, uh, evidence-based standard in people's hands that they could take to their lawmakers or their 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 prison administrations, you know, where loved ones were, and say, "What are you doing to meet this, uh, you know, evidence-based standard of of eighty-five percent of of capacity?" Especially if they're operating at one hundred and ten, which some prisons do op, op, you know, operate at one hundred and ten and one hundred and twenty times their their uh, reported capacity. And so, um, so so that was uh, probably one of the the most um, you know, it, it just is so uh, uh, dear to my heart to be able to um, use my lived experience um, in a way uh, that because we, we all have lived experience, right? You see, and you know, the, the uh, experience of clinicians is, is really, really evident in, in psychology. I mean, that's one lived experience that we really, uh, we, we, we promote quite, quite uh, a lot, but there are other lived experiences, whether that's, you know, identities that, you know, we, we bring to it, uh, whether it's being formally incarcerated, um, there are these lived experiences that we each have, that we each bring, um, that, that can really give us a unique perspective uh, to, to ask research questions that, um, uh, that you know, may, may seem like out of the ordinary for, for people without that lived experience, but for someone with it, um, uh, it, it really has enabled me to, to um, a lot, in a lot of the spaces that I'm in, offer that, that lived experience. Thank you, that's, uh, that's amazing, congratulations. We'll definitely look forward to having a chance to look at that. And I know, like I said, I know that that's particularly meaningful, I would imagine to a lot of the folks who have joined us this afternoon. Um, switching gears slightly, um, what this is a, a question from the audience. What kind of advice can you give to promote post-secondary education to incarcerated individuals? Right. So if you think about if we think about um, all of the complicating factors, psychological and otherwise, of being incarcerated, how do how do we help folks get started who maybe can't imagine themselves yet 
doing that kind of work. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a, first of all, again, it's a, it's a really important question. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell, I'm going to, I'm going to tell a story. Uh, first, I'm going to, I'm going to put in the chat that, that article that I mentioned to everyone, feel free to, to download that, that article on, on prison and uh, COVID. Um, and so, you know, I think that, I, I don't know. I don't know like what other people's aha moment is. Um, and, and that's what I kind of consider this an aha moment or, you know, coming to Jesus moment where, you know, the thought of, of higher education uh, is something that, that I can do. Um, I, I, I tell this story often and, and people on this call may even have heard it before, but in third grade, I, I tested to be in the gifted program and I didn't get in. And I lived up to, I, I, from that point on, I, I had this expectation of myself that I wasn't smart, wasn't one of the smart kids. And I lived up to that expectation all the way until, you know, 2011 or 2010 or 2009. And Caitlin Steven said to me, you have the ability to go to graduate school if you wanted. Um, that's how long I lived with that, that expectation or that, that thought. Um, and so I think that um, getting at, getting in there early and that's why I mentioned that that before but really you know motivating uh students with with strength-based language around learning um you know school is for the most part for people in prison school is a uh sometimes a very negative uh memories and you know a lot of people in prison have been I myself have been you know suspended many times in-house suspension right so so it just conjures up this negative view of self um and so um you know figuring out how, you know, what are some interventions that we can do to really um, instill in people that, you know, these, these, these inherent beliefs that we have about, you know, whether we're smart or not, or, or you know, whether we can be successful in school, uh, they, they really need to be, um, th those barriers need to, to be overcome. I mean, we need to figure out uh, how to do that. I, again, I, I, I think I'm, I'm, saying that there are probably more I, I have more questions than I than I do have answers on this on this particular topic because I haven't really uh, figured it out uh, either but um, but we need to to really think about the way that we're you know talking about education the way we're introducing education especially education in in, uh, in, in prison settings um, and and you know being um, inclusive uh, in, in that because again you know the the um, I just think it's a it's a negative thought process for a lot of people uh, just based on their their life experiences up until then um, but you know for me that's what it was it was just Kaylin Stevens Stevens uh, you know a, a instructor at Columbia Basin College giving me that that motivation and um, I don't know what that's going to be for for other people um, but you know I think that getting people like me like my friend Stan Andres like my friend Chris Beasley all these formerly incarcerated scholars to go into prisons and and give talks to um, to everyone in the prison to show them that science is not only real science is 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 possible for 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 them as a career as a career path um because i think that's the, one of the the biggest issues as well is that you know people are, aren't really inspired because they don't know anybody that um uh that they don't have anyone in their family they don't know anyone that that is you know gone on to a, a career in science or or gone on to a career in higher education um so they don't even think about that as being a, a possibility and and when they see people that share their same experience um uh, that that is uh sometimes in, emboldening that's great thank you it's it's such a it's such a powerful it's a great story and it's such a powerful reminder that um sometimes it is sometimes it can be one person who just you know, takes the time to speak possibility into another's life, right? Like really sometimes it, those, those, those are crucial points in our stories. And I think probably a lot of folks here can really imagine in some sort of context in their life, they're like, oh, right, so-and-so did that for me, right? So-and-so changed the narrative for me and um, got me reoriented. So in that same vein of, you know, what can, what can a person do if they're, if, what can one person do? We have one question from the audience. Um, how can colleges and universities who don't currently work in prisons start the process of doing classes or sending professors in to do prison education work? What would first steps look like for establishing those relationships? And then if I could add my own, um, as someone who's been on both sides 
of the table in those classrooms, both as student as teacher. Um, what's on your do and don't list for folks who are trying to get work going? Okay. Um, uh, so I, I would definitely say, um, and my, my friend is probably going to be really mad at me, but, but uh, Brian at, and I don't know why I can't think of his last name right now, but Brian at the Vera Institute of Justice, he used to be at the Department of Corrections. Um, uh, I met him a couple of years ago at a conference. Um, uh, he is, uh, he would be someone that, that I would definitely uh, reach out to. He was kind of in charge of Second Chance Pell for the West Coast. Um, I will, I'll find before the end of the, before the end of our conversation, I'll find his email and put it in the, in the uh, chat. Again, he'll probably, I, I don't know that he'll be, be mad at me or not, but uh, I, I think he's always, I mean, he's just always been a great help for me. Any questions that I've had around this issue. Um, Pat Siebert Love at the Department of Corrections is the one that runs the, is the head of um, uh, the, the, the Department of Corrections. And so I think that she would be a good first person to, to potentially get some information from uh, regarding what can be done in, in Washington. Um, as far as, you know, what can be done, and I'll, I'll kind of get done, get like focus in a little bit on, on WSU and some things that I think would be really important. And this kind of gets away from maybe even college and prison programming. But, you know, uh, for those that don't know, me and Anna were on the uh, IRB at WSU at the same time. And, um, you know, I was, I was actually, uh, we, we were both chosen to be on the, the prison uh, the, the specifically uh, to the prison research section because of our, our completely different experiences, right? Yours uh, with, with your experience and mine as from my lived experience, I was, I was specifically chosen uh, for that uh, based on my lived experience. And so I think that WSU could really take the lead uh, in this area uh, by making it a requirement that at least one person on the IRB has lived experience. And I think that in, in the criminal justice system. Um, and I think that this would serve a couple of different things. First of all, it would, it would force WSU to recruit students, to actively recruit students that are formerly incarcerated. Um, and, and, you know, it would, um, or I, I shouldn't say that, it would force them to recruit students, graduate students and postdocs, um, you know, potentially with, with that lived experience. And it would show um, that WSU really values and prioritizes uh, that that kind of, of lived experience and, and bringing that to the um, you know to the forefront in in, in the research uh, that they do. So that's kind of one idea that I've always kind of thought about in the back of my mind um, because you know the, there really is no there really is no requirement for these you know for for, for the the um, uh, in a lot of areas and, and and that's just one area that I could I, I could think of. Um, you know, the, the other area, the other thing that, you know, people could potentially do, I, I worked in the Coyote Ridge uh, uh, prison. Um, uh, I, I worked there with uh, uh, Denise Cammers, who actually was uh, kind of the, the go-between between, between Walla, Walla Community College uh, and, and the in college and prison program. Uh, she'll probably kill me for asking you to reach out to her as well, but, you know, she was always a great resource for me, and they're always looking for people that are, um, you know, people that are passionate about this work to go in and teach at the uh, uh, at, at the college and prison program at through Walla Walla Community College. Um, again, everything is kind of weird right now because of, of, of COVID and, and the there's not a whole lot of in-person stuff happening uh, right now, which, which really throws a wrench in things, I think. But, um, but those are three people uh, that I would definitely uh, uh, reach out to. So Pat Siebert Love, uh, Denise Cammers, and then uh, I think Loretta too, she's, an, she's a WSU grad. I think she has something to do with, with prison uh, education. Um, before I get off the call, I, I will find these people's emails and I will hopefully put it into the, into the um, chat. That's great, thank you. Um, so there's a we have a, there's a question here that I think is really important, and I'm so happy that it was asked by a WSU Tri Cities alum, an esteemed alum. Uh, so we're talking a little bit, you know, as we it's always hard when when we tell our own stories and how things worked out for us. And so this question says, you know, um, we want to be careful about creating narratives of exceptionalism 
right? And so uh, we do want teachers that say, hey, you look like you can make it, but we want teachers that are saying that to everyone, right? And so how can we prevent sort of narratives of exceptionalism? Because then, you know, when, when that person makes it, it's like, oh, well, that's unattainable. That was that person's experience. Adam, do you have any insight on what you would like to see and maybe not just teachers, but yeah, like how can we how can we sort of work against exceptionalism, and how we and how we shift the narrative? Yeah, and so I, do you think that the person that was asking that was asking it like as it pertains to teaching college in in prison, or do you think that they were uh, asking that as to uh, teaching like outside or, or experience kind of teaching outside of prison? So my guess, we'll see if they come back. We'll watch the chat see if they come back with more. But I think it was when we we're when we we're talking about this. This is how powerful it is when somebody kind of intervenes in your life and and speaks something different into your story, right? And so, how can we do that work in a way that it still probably has to be done human to human? But think about how to kind of, I think scale is probably not the right words I want here. But how can we how can we make that thing happen at a larger scale so that that we're we're reaching more people with this story of like, hey, you can make it, you know? I, I don't know if I'm in. I don't know if I'm in the ballpark. Yeah, no, like no, just, uh, totally, totally. I understand. And, and it's such a, a, a very, I mean, it's a super important question, but it's, it's, it's a very broad topic that uh, is, it, I mean, I, I, it's one of those things where I, if I had the answer, like I would, I, I would do it all the time and that's all I would do. And I, I think, you know, very, very, um, I think drawing on what, what the, uh, the person prefaced the, the question with was that everyone's lived experience is so different. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, what led to my incarceration, what led to uh, my, you know, aha moments along the way. And, you know, they were all educational really in, in, um, in nature, right. It didn't, they weren't like, you know, coming to Jesus. It was this, 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 you know, compounding snowballing effect of, of, of education and, and higher education in particular that really kind of open opened my eyes and um, if I had that 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 perfect um, thing for everyone in, in understanding their life experiences I, I, I would definitely uh, do that uh, as far as you know answers of, of how to do that um, uh, and 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 kind of be more inclusive and, and try and understand that I, I unfortunately and I, I I think sometimes just saying I don't have an answer for that is actually the best answer because I, I really I don't have an answer for that. I wish I did. I wish there was more research on it. I wish that that you know we really did understand that. Um, but uh, I hate to even venture a guess on that because I could probably be so wrong and do so much damage by by trying to guess on that um, because it is uh, it, it's such a hard question to answer. Yeah, it is. It is such a hard question to answer. Although I'm kind of just trying to go back through our transcript in my mind as I'm listening. And I'm wondering too, maybe even your point about um, the value of lived experience. And so then folks in positions of leadership, let's say at WC Tri-Cities, for instance, um, just starting to recognize uh, a wider variety, the value of a wider variety of lived experiences might be a, a baby step towards that, right? So to not, as a, let's say as a professor, I'm in a classroom and I notice, oh, so-and-so seems like they're grad school material, right? So maybe it's on me as a professor to, Think more expansively um, and and value a wider um, set of set of lived experiences when I imagine what I think I imagine about a particular. Yeah, and I, and I should preface that to you know the the comment that Kaylin Stevens made to me was not in class. It was it was in her office. It was a uh, it was a like one on one kind of a thing. So it wasn't like she said in the middle of class like you have the ability to go to school and no one else does in here. Um, it, it wasn't that kind of a of a thing. Um, I, I will. I'll just comment real quick. I, I, I think it's an important to, to, to comment. I do think that that uh, in-class experience is, is so important. I had two different uh, experiences. Um, one with, with uh, Dr. Tregresser uh, while I was at, at WSU, bringing up and, and being very uncomfortable bringing up my, my lived experience um, uh, because I didn't know the reaction that I was going to get, but bringing up my, you know, being in prison in the middle of class, in the midst of a of a of a class conversation, uh, and 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 of complete and total acceptance and um, uh, 
uh, and, and just, you know, really felt valued in, in my perspective um, in, in, in her psychology course, uh, but in a different course, in a, in a criminal justice course that I was taking, um, again, kind of speaking up and, and being very uncomfortable doing so, talking about my lived experience in the criminal justice system, uh, and then being pulled to the side after class and, you know, having someone tell me, you really shouldn't bring that up in, in here, and, and, you know, kind of questioning why, and them saying, well, you know, you, you might make, on uh, you know, people feel, you might make the other students feel uncomfortable, or you might you know, make other people kind of feel that you're, you're dangerous, or you're not, you're not a part of the, the community or, or something like that. And I just like, it was, it was so disheartening, uh, because, you know, this was coming from a, a position, I considered a kind of a position of leadership. Um, and for someone to really not understand that these are, these are issues that are happening in our community. And if you're really going to talk about understanding the, the communities that, that, that schools are, you know, pulling students from these are issues that are happening in our in our community, and and if you don't even recognize that that uh, this this lived experience is important in the classroom, it, it, it was really again I've gotten a much better perspective, but at the time it was it was really like oh my god I need to have guilt and shame around this this and and not ever not ever talk about it, and and so again I, I think I'm really really lucky today in that I I can I can talk about these things um, and not. Not have that, no matter where I'm at. Um, but you know, other people don't have that. I didn't have that in that criminal justice class, you know, ten years ago that I was I was taking. And so, um, the the point is really really well taken. And, and I think that teachers uh, do have instructors, uh, professors do have a really important job uh, in the classroom of, of making sure that they're, um, you know, uh, valuing the lived experience of everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's really instructive. I think, like you said, like for those in, for educators in the room, but I think even just for community members, right? As we think about reentry, like what does it mean to be a person who's coming out of um, an incarceration experience, and and what does it mean when you know when the community responds in ways that are negative, right? Or that you're not able to bring your whole self to a space, and so uh, it's really making me think about reentry in general, and it's making me wonder if there's anything else about reentry that you would like us. To kind of like things that we should think about when we think about how we support reentry, either either as educators, but really more broadly as community members, um, things we should try to do, things we should maybe avoid. I don't know. Open ended. Yeah, and I, I mean, I try. I, I think I tried to key in on this a little bit with the, uh, you know, the idea of. Um, I'll answer it. I've already answered it kind of from the, the community perspective, right? Just understanding, uh, especially the the resources that are needed for uh, early reentry. Uh, I mean, I think that the common thought is, you know, so sometimes I, I think this is changing, but slowly but surely. But th this idea that you know, we don't want to, we don't want to spend any taxpayer dollars to to help people coming out of prison, um, you know, because they've they've made mistakes, right? That's that's kind of the the narrative that has been pushed for a long time, um, and and really understanding that early, you know, th that early reentry period is so vital. And if people don't have resources, they're going to go back to what's what's. If I wouldn't have had a place, to, I mean, again, I, I talk about the what I had and and how it was so different. I think than than sometimes the the norm, um, but. Yeah, that early reentry period is so important. If people don't have resources, if they don't have housing, if they don't have stable income, if they don't have, you know, all of these things that we kind of take for granted, um, you know, they're they're not going to be successful. I mean, that's that's just the the reality of the situation. We have no problem spending, you know, seventy eight thousand dollars a year to have house someone in prison, but you know, we have a problem that once the, we, they get out, we we should you know offer them housing in the in the community or give them a twenty thousand dollar a year stipend for, um, you know, for, for an apartment complex, right? Even though we're saving money as a society, uh, for some reason, this, this, this freebie for, 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 you know, people that have made mistakes just doesn't set well with, with people. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, that from a community perspective, I, I think it really is just so important to understand that, that, um, I'll, I'll talk really briefly about it from a, a WSU perspective. And, and so, you know, if if they're watching, I'm I'm you know I'm talking straight to uh, uh, Chancellor Haynes. I'm talking straight to uh, uh, President Schultz. Uh, if you're listening, please champion these these issues. Take the lead. Uh, create programming 
for for people with uh, histories uh, of incarceration. I think that you know WSU. Uh, I have to give them 100% credit. You know, I, I think that they, they've done a really great job of meeting the needs of other marginalized uh, uh, populations. So people with mental health issues, learning problems. I think that the Access Center, at least the Access Center at, at WSU in Pullman, um, is is just incredible and, and the work that they're doing is incredible. Um, I would love to see a similar effort put forth for uh, to, to meet the needs of, of people that are coming out of prison or with lived experience in the, in the in the legal system. I mean we we need those same kinds of supports whether it's counseling, uh, whether it's you know housing supports or whether it's you know one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, tutors or, or whatever that that may be there are specific needs and, and if we saw that same kind of outpouring of, of support um, um, and, and community center. I mean, that access center is, is incredible uh, over at WSU. And, you, and when you walk in there, um, you're immediately surrounded by, by people that un, kind of understand your, your lived experience. And so that would be uh, a huge step in the right direction. I, I personally believe that colleges actually have a moral obligation to tackle issues that plague the communities that their students are going back to and that they come from, right? We need to hold colleges and universities accountable. We need to hold the college administration uh, accountable uh, and force them to, to really lead on these issues. So I'm asking them to, to really lead, um, uh, take the lead on this issue. Um, I, I had great conversations and, you know, we, we I feel like, um, you know, with, with, I met many times with with Craig Parks and uh, Ellen Taylor and uh, Faith Lutz and Paula Adams uh, at, at WSU and Pullman, and we had really great talks about how we we're going to kind of change the world, but but really with no funding and 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 no real educational or uh, uh, you know WSU support behind that that work. Um, it, it really is not probably going to go go very far. I, I applaud those uh, those. those uh, you know, Craig Parks in the in the um, provost's office. I, I applaud uh, Student Affairs and, and Ellen Taylor for having those conversations with me. Um, but you know, I, I would I would urge uh, people to to go a step further and see you know create funding mechanisms, create administrative positions uh, to really kind of tackle these issues and and see what we can do. There are great. Uh, uh, examples of it happening around the country. The BARD initiative, uh, prison initiative is incredible. If you haven't watched that documentary, please watch it. Um, the underground scholars at UC Berkeley and other Pac-12 schools uh, that, that are you know, creating these underground scholars, which are uh, programs for, for people that are formerly incarcerated um, and, and not only programming, but resources for, for people that are formerly incarcerated. Uh, the PD Green Project is another great one that I love, Hudson Link. Uh, there, there's so many great ones, but um, uh, but yeah, f uh, forging a, a just a kind of like, I love what Faith Lutz did. She, she's done some work with the Inside Out, right? Um, kind of making this seamless transition um, from college in prison uh, to college out of prison. I think WSU has a great uh, opportunity to be able to do that with the reinstitution of, of Second Chance Pell. Um, they, they could really, if they wanted to, uh, especially with the, you know, the different um, colleges that they have kind of across the state, they could really do something special uh, if this were was uh, to be a, a priority of, of, of the, the president and, and of, of the, the chancellors at the, um, at the regional colleges. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's in their hands. I, I think that it would be great. And I think that it would be, um, you know, WSU could be known as, as kind of the, the leader in this, in this area if they, if they wanted to, to take that initiative to, to do that. That's great. Dr. Vest, thank you. You have given us, um, given us so much to think about and so much to dream about and really so much to roll up our sleeves over. So uh, I just, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us and um, for sharing your story with us and your expertise and your recently published article. It's all, it's all amazing and we're very grateful and thankful for your time. So I will turn it back over to Christine. Yeah, so just once again, uh, thank you to everyone who contributed to this event and made it possible. Um, and also to Dr. Vest, um, we've just been honored to have you here and to learn from you and are um, thankful for all the resources that you've shared. So I just wanna give a plug that 
the, the article and some of those contacts are in the chat if you haven't taken a look yet. I know we had a couple of people that asking for that in the question and answer. So, and thank you also to all of our attendees um, for um, coming out for our first uh, community classroom event for the spring. And we hope to see you again in March and April. Yeah, can I just say one last time, I, I can't thank you enough for allowing me to, to be here. Um, you know, WSU Tri-Cities will always hold a super special place in my heart. And anytime anyone asks me to, to come back and speak, uh, I will jump at the, the honor and the, and, and the, the uh, privilege to, to come back and do that. It is, um, it changed my life. I mean, and I can't, I don't think I could ever quite pay that back, but I would love to, to give it a valiant effort. And so I can't thank you enough, Anna, for allowing me to, to come back and do this. And, and, and you know, uh, coming back in this space as well uh, is just so important. So, so thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I really, really appreciate it.